Good evening, everyone. How are you? All right, got an okay, good. I love it. Well, my name's Pastor Rick, and if we haven't met, it's glad to like be here with you guys. I'm going to tell you guys why it's Super Sunday in just a bit. It really is a Super Sunday, but not because of what people are kicking around for like a gajillion dollars right now. But it is Super Sunday for a specific reason. And we're going to learn about it in John chapter 20 tonight. John chapter 20. The whole sanctuary just went dark, guys, but don't worry. The light will shine through. Okay, John chapter 20. John chapter 20, starting in verse 1. Get your apps out and open your Bibles up, and we'll have it on the screens for you guys. Here we go. Now, the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early, while it was still dark, and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Then she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple, whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Peter, therefore, went out, and the other disciple, and were going to the tomb. So they both ran together, and the other disciple outran Peter and came to the tomb first. And he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen cloths lying there, yet he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb, and he saw the linen cloths lying there, and the handkerchief that had been around his head not lying with the linen cloths, but folded together in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who came to the tomb first, went in also, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not know the scripture, that he must rise again from the dead. Then the disciples went away again to their own homes. But Mary stood outside by the tomb weeping, And as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. Then they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Now when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there and did not know it was Jesus Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? She, supposing him to be the gardener, said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him. I think she said it with that type of like tone. And I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him, Rabboni, which is to say teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me. For I have not yet ascended to my father, but go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father and to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things to her. Let's stop there and let's pray. Heavenly Father, it truly is a super Sunday, Lord, as we recount the day of your resurrection, Lord, here as John has recorded This is our hope, Lord, that you have risen from the dead. We place our hope firmly in you, Lord, and we choose now to worship you with studying your word, God. So please, Holy Spirit, fill this place, fill our minds, and draw us closer to you. In Jesus' name, we all agreed by saying, Amen. Told you it was Super Sunday. Right here, biblical, 2,000 years ago. Jesus rose from the dead. Right here as John records. This is such a cool biography. That's what we're reading right here. John's account of Jesus' life. I love reading biographies. I really enjoy reading biographies about people's lives. One thing that they all have in in common is that they usually stop after the guy's dead. John's biography about Jesus, it's just getting started right here on Super Sunday. Why? Why? Because he died, but that was definitely not the end of the story. 
for the last few weeks, we've all been learning that Jesus was not a prisoner. He was not captured by surprise. He was not murdered. No, he was totally in control. He had Pilate right where he wanted him. He had Annas, the former high priest, and Caiaphas, the current high priest, right where he wanted those guys, and all the Jewish leadership, right where he wanted them. Just like us, right now. He has us right where he wants us. Because he's going to show off his love and his power right here as it unfolds in Scripture. John's biography is awesome because it starts with, he is risen. So, tonight's passage, we're going to learn right here, this is the hope of the Christian faith. This is the hope we have because of Jesus' death and resurrection. We're going to learn that when it comes to spiritual truth, Be prepared to believe what you haven't seen. When it comes to spiritual truth, you got to be prepared to believe in what you haven't seen. And we're also going to see the Lord turn tears into joy. So let's jump in right here at verse 1 in John chapter 20. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Okay, if you guys have not yet been to Israel, Pastor Ed is always plugging Israel and showing off how cool it is. I always tell him, if you need someone to carry your bags, I'm your guy, Pastor Ed. If you're watching, I'm your guy. But for those of us that haven't been there, we have some cool pictures of what the garden tomb looks like. Here it is. This is the garden tomb in Israel. Um, Let's see what we can pick out. Something looks a little weird. You think they had that brick wall there back in the first century? I don't think so. As Christians have made their pilgrimage over there, everyone wants to take a little sliver of that wall with them. And rather than it caving in on itself, they've retrofitted it with these bricks. You can also see something here in the center going into the tomb. There's some steps. Because that is the trough where the giant stone would be rolled uh, in front of and away from it, as we read in our story tonight. It's a place we can all go visit. Buy yourself a couple of plane tickets, because you're going to need a guide. And I'm here, okay? I got my go bag ready to go. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding, by the way. I'm being sarcastic. But you can totally go there, enjoy Israel. So the garden tomb. This is stuff that really happened. That's why it's there. Also, it was the first day of the week. It was Sunday. This is really happening in Mary's life. It was dark. It was so dark that she probably would have carried a little oil lamp in her hand like the one I have here. No, I did not get all Laura Croft and go tomb raiding. This is a replica of a first century oil lamp. I'm going to stand off to here because I was told I need to stand like this so you guys could see it. So this is a replica of a first century oil lamp. The oil goes in here. Here's the wick that dips in there. And you would light it, and it would cast light for you. No, I don't just keep these around my house. Pastor Bob Probert, he's our resident rabbi here. He had this on his desk, so I snagged it today and wanted to bring it in to do some show and tell. A replica of a first century oil lamp that was found. Pretty cool, huh? This is what she would have used as she was making her way toward the garden tomb. Okay, so Mary's on her way there all early in the morning because she loved the Lord. She loved her teacher. So she gets up early, devotes her time. Shouldn't we all make a habit of devoting some time for our, uh, to showcase our love for the Lord, some quiet time in Scripture Mary's on her way, filled with tears over the the recent events that, that happened just three days prior. This Mary is about to have her tears turned into joy. This Mary is Mary from Magdala. Mary, the one whom she had seven demons in her, cast out. This is the Mary, the first one to see the empty tomb and tell about it. God can use anybody, just like Mary in our story. I don't know what caused her to get these demons in her, 
But all I know is she had an encounter with the Lord and her life was changed. And this lady, this dear woman, was used to showcase the finding of Earth's history, an empty tomb, a resurrected Jesus. Man, he can use anybody. Okay, so, verse 2. Then she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved and said to them, They have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. It's empty. She ran out to go find the guys. She's running like crazy. She's so worried, and she doesn't know what's going on. So she goes and tells Peter and the, disi- and the disciple whom Jesus loved. Let's, let's break down the cast of tonight's passage. We already talked about Mary. Mary from Magdala. That's why she's Mary Magdalene. Okay. She was the one chosen to give the first word of the resurrection. Peter, Simon Peter, he's the guy that walked on water with Jesus. He's also the guy that denied Jesus three times before the rooster crowed just a couple of days ago. And John the disciple whom Jesus loved. He's the one writing the story tonight, which is why we're going to see he's the one who gets to recount history. He's letting everyone know, as a 90-year-old man, I'm the one who beat Peter to the, to the tomb. I'm the one who outran Peter. I think it was more than just physical fitness, though, that was keeping Peter down. I think Peter had a couple of uh, issues still with what happened the night before. We'll get into that in a second. Peter therefore went out and the other disciple went to the tomb. So they ran together and the other disciple outran Peter and came to the tomb first. Peter is beating himself up. Have you ever been there? Have you ever beat yourself up out of something you're like, oh, why did I do that? We just started feeling a little guilty, like, oh, I cannot believe that. I know I have. I've felt guilt and shame, and I've also felt conviction. And those are two different things. Feeling guilty is, man, I, I feel guilty. Conviction is a gift. That's a tool that Jesus, that the Lord uses to draw us closer in our relationship. He'll use that mistake to draw us closer to the Lord. You guys understand that? Conviction's a lot different than this just like guilty condemnation where we're just judged harshly and told what a dirty, rotten scoundrel we are because of our, well, we are dirty, rotten scoundrels saved by grace like Peter was. I think that's what was was holding up Peter. I think he might have been like, oh my gosh, I I can't believe it. Okay, let's go. I'll go with you, John. I, I hope it's not a trap. I hope there's not just a bunch of Romans or the Jewish religious leaders like, waiting for us there. I'm I'm sure he had all kinds of thoughts flowing through his head. But Jesus forgives. If you're having any type of an issue where you feel like, man, I'm just being, I'm being like stumbled with my thoughts. I'm feeling terrible. Talk with a believing friend. If something's going on in the background, do what it says in James 5, right? Talk with someone else. Don't let hell put things in your head that are going to just freak you out and cause a division between you and the Lord. God will forgive. Run to him. Run to him. And he, stooping down, looking in, saw the linen cloths lying there. Yet he did not go in. I don't know why, but John waited for some reason before he went in. Simon Peter came following him, and he went into the tomb, and he saw the linen cloths lying there. Now, last chapter, we heard about Nicodemus and Joseph from Arimathea. Okay, so Joseph, he had this tomb it purchased. It was his, and he asked Pilate. He had some pool with Pilate, the Roman governor that oversaw the trials of Jesus, and he, after, he asked, said, hey, can I have the body? I'd like to put him in the tomb. 
I was telling you that Joseph of Arimathea, he was kind of like this like undercover agent that God had planted in the Sanhedrin so that way he could care for his son's body. Nicodemus, who was a Pharisee, which was another religious, legal, uh, religious teacher for the Jews, a Pharisee, he'd come to believe. He was the one in John 3 that came to Jesus by night asking him uh, about things of the Lord. Well, so they take this body away. Nicodemus had like 100 pounds of aloe. And so when these linen cloths were lying there, it's kind of like a cocoon was formed. All this aloe was sitting there, so there's this like little shell left there. Verse 7 says, And the handkerchief that had been around his head, not lying with the linen cloths, was nice and folded together in place by itself. Okay, so here's a, this thing. So these cloths that were like in this like cocoon shaped. Um, the cloth I've heard and read, let's say the cloth is about 14 feet long, okay, 14 feet long by about 18 inches wide. And what you would do is the, you'd lay the cloth out, you'd lay the body down on it, and then the, the cloth would fold lengthwise over the body. And so then these cloths would then bind and tie it together. So they see this kind of shell-looking thing. Peter sees this cloth, this linen cloth, folded nicely by itself. I attribute that mostly to Jesus' mom teaching her boy how to make his bed and fold his clothes. Kids, pay attention. The one kid in the audience who's mine. I'll pay for that later. So Jesus, be more like Jesus, all you young ones. Fold all your stuff. He sees it, and he's still, I don't know what goes through Peter's mind, but I don't know what impression that left. Verse 8 says, the other disciple who came to the tomb first went in also. He saw, and he believed. This is John. John saw and believed. He sees with understanding is what he's telling us here. It's like the bulb went on, like, oh my gosh, he's alive. And he's telling us, I believe that he's the Messiah, that he's the one, he rose from the dead. I mean, that's what Romans 10 is all about. Romans 10 says, if you believe Jesus is the Messiah and rose from the dead, you will be saved. John believes. Let's talk about this word saw, okay? We've seen it now a few times throughout the chapter. We saw it in verse 5, we saw it in verse 6, and we've seen it now in verse 8. When John wrote this word, he used three different words for the English word saw. See, this is what he means. In John chapter, five, in John chapter 20, verse 5, he says he kind of glanced and looked in. He just kind of peeked around the corner a little, Okay. Then in John chapter 6, a careful look, an observation was made. A careful look. Okay, it went from a glance to now a look. But now we see he saw and believed. He perceived with intelligent comprehension. It seems like that's what happens with some people. You kind of like touch the water with your toe like, uh, that might have been kind of fun, that little Halloween party we had at your church. Okay, whatever. I left. I took a glance. I'm out of here. Okay, I know my niece or nephew's in the Christmas choir. I'll come. I'll take a look in and observe. I'm giving you guys tools and tricks here to like get family and friends involved in church. And then Pastor Ed gets filled with the Spirit and brings like this amazing killer or life-saving message on Christmas Eve. And then someone's sitting around, and then they really, the light goes on, and they perceive with intelligent comprehension, Jesus is the Messiah. I mean, some people, the light just goes on fast, like they're in. I was not that person. I was totally raised in a Christian household, but it, it took me until my late 20s before I saw with intelligent comprehension God's hand in my life, giving me grace. I didn't deserve it, but he gave it to me anyways. That's what's happening here. We see through John's experience what happened 
is he took his eyes off the empty tomb and put it firmly on Jesus. Everybody's freaking out about the empty tomb. But really, let's just like freak out about Jesus. He's alive. His Holy Spirit's alive and working in each of us. Has us all here on purpose. He's telling us, I love you and I want you to draw closer to me. These are these stories that, that should build your faith. Build your confidence in me. Placing our eyes firmly on the Lord, taking our eyes off the empty tomb, place them on the Lord. See, you got to be prepared when you're walking with the Lord to start, start believing in the things you just can't see sometimes. <clears throat> For as yet they did not know the scripture, that he must rise again from the dead. Let me read that out of the New Living Translation. For until then, they still hadn't understood the scriptures that said Jesus must rise from the dead. You guys get the clearer picture of what John's saying? He's saying, here's Rick's translation, I had no idea what was going on that morning. I had no idea. I'm just being honest with you guys, John says. He had zero clue. They didn't know the scripture, but Jesus, he told them several times, hey, on the third day, I'm going to rise. That gives a guy like me hope because I don't always understand everything at first glance. It takes a long time to like get through and like study sometimes. Sometimes the Holy Spirit is just like downloading like stuff into me. But I really got to like, like sit down and read and pray. And I ask all the other pastors questions and I'll say something. They're like, oh, I don't know if I'd say it this way. Maybe this is what you mean. I'm like, oh yeah, that's what I mean. Like, it takes a little bit to get this stuff. And I love that John, as a 90-year-old man, he's writing his gospel now. He's a 90-year-old dude writing his stuff. He's the last one to write his gospel account. Matthew, Mark, and Luke had already written theirs. John's left, and he's writing his right now. And he's saying, I didn't get it back then. Not like I do now, after seeing him, touching him, hugging him, eating fish breakfast with him. We'll get to that later. But I get it now. Then the disciples went away again to their own homes. Do you guys remember from the last chapter who's at John's house? Jesus sitting there going, Hey, this is your mother. This is your mother. And John, it says, in John 19, he says, And then I took her to my own home. John sees and he believes. He already kicked he, I mean, I don't want to say, it. he beat Peter on the way to the tomb when he was, like, trying to figure it out. Now he's pumped. He's a believer. He's on fire. He's saved. He's pumped. So he races back to who's in his house. Now it's Mary, Jesus' mom. How cool is that? Can you imagine what that would have been like for her, going what she went through? And then now John comes back busting through the door. I wonder what that interaction was like. That's crazy. That actually happened. But Mary, Mary Magdalene, just so we don't get confused, we're still talking about Mary from Magdala. Mary stood outside the tomb weeping. Tears are getting ready to get turned into joy. Hold on. She's weeping by herself because the other guys, they had left. Peter and John they're gone. And by the way, Peter, we didn't hear about him believing yet. Okay? We don't hear about it. He went silent. We have no idea his status right now. Okay? But John, he's like, I saw and believed right now. Peter just kind of looked. Okay? And then he went, he went to his own house. Mary stayed, Mary stayed back, crying loudly. That word is like loud crying, not a little like whimper, loud crying. She's grieving. I've been to a bunch of funerals over my lifetime. I've, a, I've been a part of a lot of funerals too. Often, it's kind of interesting, believers will come up to me, not all the time, but it's happened, where believers will come up to me and say, Oh, I know I shouldn't be crying because they're in a better place, but I just can't stop. I'm so sorry. And I'm like, what are you apologizing to me for? It's okay to grieve. It's okay to cry when a loved one is lost. 
It's okay to grieve when a job is lost. It's grieving. It's grieving over loss or a marriage or, or uh, anything you lose. Someone breaks into your car and steals all your CDs. That happened to me a long time ago. These little discs that used to have music on them. A whole bunch of them got stolen once. And I was like, oh, man, I was all upset for months and months. And I got an iPod. People can grieve over loss. And it's okay to grieve over a lost loved one at a funeral. Not because you, your faith is lacking. It's because your body misses talking to them. Just the other night, uh, my wife and I, we were talking about how we wish our kids could have met like, a couple of our aunts and uncles and stuff. That they would have just had to kill our time with them. And we were kind of grieving a little bit, but it was more of a joy. We weren't to tears, but we were talking about that. We miss them, and it's okay. It's okay to grieve. It's okay to cry, believer. If you need someone to talk to, call me up here at the church. There's pastors here. We'll talk with you and love on you. So she sees these two angels in white sitting there, one at the head and the other at the feet of where Jesus' body had lain. Then they said to her, woman, why are you weeping? She says to them, because they have taken away my Lord. I do not know where they have laid him. Jesus is very personal to Mary, as he should be to us. My Lord, your Lord. We should have that intimate contact. Hey, they took my Lord away. And I love that she's just talking with these guys. Because most of the time when angels, if you guys don't remember, when an angel appears, usually the first thing they say is, do not be afraid. And they're like talking to her, and Mary's like, where have you guys been? They've taken him away. I don't know where my Lord is. She doesn't care about these angels, and they're not just dressed in white. They're emanating white. They're emanating light. She's not oblivious. She just doesn't have her eyes on the empty tomb. She doesn't have her eyes on these guys. She just has her eyes on the desire of her heart at this time, which is Jesus. Our our desires are the same. Lord, I pray that you strengthen my desire for you. And then she turns around, it says in verse 14. Now when she had said this, she turned her back to them. She just like does not about face. And she saw Jesus standing there and did not know it was Jesus. I have no idea why she didn't know. I have no idea what was going on there. But I cannot believe she didn't recognize him. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Where are you seeking? She, looking at him, thinks, oh, this must be the gardener that's supposed to be taking care of the garden tomb. What have you done with him? I mean, she is bold. I love this lady. Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. I love it. I don't think Jesus was just trying to mess with her, though. See, Jesus has this great way throughout the Bible of using stories to draw people in, questions with people who think they're smart to draw them in. I think he sees her broken heart, and he's just bringing her all the way. He's just drawing her in. Are you going through a confusing time right now? Maybe God's drawing you into more conversation with him. Prayer. Maybe he's... He's just priming that pump of grace that's getting ready to be poured out all over. He's drawing us in. I know he's done it with my life when I'm like, why? What are you doing? Because I don't recognize his hand on the situation. And then all of a sudden, boom, he solves it better than I could have ever dared or dreamt to ask for. And I have no idea why God's doing the things that he's doing in your life at this moment, but I know he's drawing us closer to him. Jesus said to her, Mary, she turned around to him and, Rabboni, oh my goodness, it's you. Which is to say, teacher, why'd you have that gardener disguise on? That's crazy. Take that mustache off. She, it's, her eyes are wide open and she's receiving him and he's receiving her. Oh my goodness, I told you her tears would be turned into joy. Man. Weeping may endure for a night, Psalm 30, verse 5 says, but joy cometh in the morning. Praise God. Weeping come, happens at the night, but man, joy comes in the morning. Rabboni. 
It's a word that's like a highly, for a highly respected teacher, Rabboni. Jesus said to her, Mary, 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 don't cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my Father. But go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and you to your Father. Man, you want to, you think there's some real tackles going on right now at the Super Bowl? She was like, boom, clung on to him. I could totally relate to this picture. Years ago, my brother, my older brother, he, um, he served like 20 years in the Navy. He was just all over the world. Well, one time he was gone, like for like a long time. I think he was out to sea for like 10 months. All of a sudden, email goes off. We can't talk anymore. All of a sudden, I get a note saying, meet me at the docks, I'm coming in. Well, his ship was outside of Haiti during their earthquake, and he was, uh, his ship was sending in supplies, so he was out there forever out to sea. I hadn't seen him in so long, and my, young, my older brother, he's a lot skinnier than I am, so I could bear hug that snot out of him, quite literally. And when I saw him, I remember seeing him at the dock, and I grabbed him and I held onto him, and he's like, dude, 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 let me go, we have the whole car ride up. I get it, when you're excited to see your loved one. Man, it's so joyful. It's amazing. That's how she was clinging to him. She was hugging him and loving on him. Okay, okay, don't go, it's enough, enough. Her tears are turned into joy as she's grabbed onto and latched onto who? To Jesus. I think that's kind of the formula. You want some joy? Cling on to him. You want some relief? Cling on to him. Don't let go. Having some challenge? Run to him. Run to him and talk with him. Pray to him. Lord, I need you. Sometimes that's my prayer. I need you. I need you. I need you. He's there. He wants to hear from you. He, he, he loves us. John writes very accurately, the disciple whom Jesus loved. Put pen to paper, put thumbs to keypad, write it. You are the disciple that he loves. Well, I'm not a disciple. Yeah, yeah, if you're here on a Sunday night during Super Bowl, dude, you're a disciple. You're a follower of Jesus. You're ready and willing to be transformed more into his image. If you're watching online right now and you're not watching some funny commercial, which I heard weren't that good this year, you are a disciple of Jesus because you're learning. You're sitting at his feet, clinging to him and his message. Cling to him. Run to him. Have your joy restored. It only happens with Jesus. And he has something for Mary to do. Did you guys catch that? Don't cling to me. Go. He's saying, hey, hey guys, I get it. I love it. We're here. But we too have to go. We too have to go. He has something for Mary to do. Go tell the brethren. Go tell them. He has something for us to do. Go tell. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples in verse 18 that she had seen the Lord, and that he had spoken these things to her. I have seen the Lord. Mark, Mark, the book of Mark, he wrote, he reports that these believers were mourning and weeping, and that they would not believe her. Like, they were probably like, what? She runs in, hey, guys, I'm telling you, I just saw him and talked to him. I totally thought it was Joseph's gardener, but it wasn't. It was him. He told me to come tell you guys. I read this the other day. A group of friends and I from our juvenile hall ministry, we send uh, quotes and verses to each other, and this one got sent. It had these uh, statements on there. It said, Jesus gave up his life so we could have ours back. He died like us, so we could live like him. He not only pleased his father, but received us as a bounty. This is the mark of a true leader. Leaders pay any price to get the job done. 
I love that. And that's what he did. He gave up everything. Mary runs back to them and tells them what she saw. Now, she couldn't transfer her experience to these people. She couldn't, she couldn't do anything but just share. She told them what happened. And I'm sure she did it with like a lot of enthusiasm. This just happened. Romans 10 verse 17 tells us, so faith, confidence, trust, hope, faith, faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. That's what changes lives. Not all the stuff I'm saying, not all the stuff we hear on podcasts and YouTube and all that. It's God's word. It, God promises in his word. In Isaiah, he says, hey, my word, when I send it out, it's going to produce fruit. It's not coming back to me void. It's going to produce fruit, my word, because it's sent out with my purpose, God says. It's his promise to keep, not ours. So what do we have to do? Go. We are the ones who have to share. We're the ones that take the word of God back into our houses, back to our family, back to our cubicles, back to our, I don't know, hopefully you guys don't all have to live in cubicles like I do. Your offices, your, your, whatever your place is, your streets. Thank you. Get it out there. Go tell it. What is she saying? Is she making up some story? She's only telling what she experienced. That's a testimony. When I used to go, like, skip trace and find people and drag them into court, we only wanted to hear what they experienced. I didn't want to hear what this person told this person, down the block told I don't need any of that. There's too much going on in the streets. We would find them and we would say, hey, tell us exactly what you heard, what you saw, what you experienced. That's what we want to know in court. That's what a testimony is. We share what we experience. Has God done something crazy in your life? Like forgiven you of every single thing you've ever done? Has the Holy Spirit gone inside your heart and just changed it all around? That's what we share. I forget who said the quote, but it's like, preach the gospel and don't say a word. You guys ever heard that? So maybe you're not out there Bible thumping and beating people up. Maybe you're just being loving and kind and gentle. Maybe you show off self-control. Maybe you're just faithful with commitments and faithful to people. And then people start to wonder, what changed in your life? Man, and then they'll ask you, hey, what happened? What changed? Well, went to this church that was open on Super Bowl Sunday. Got my life changed. Jesus changed my life. Go and tell it. That's what he's calling us to do. Go and encourage one another. This is just as much for me as it is for you, so I hope it doesn't sound like I'm harping on you. This was just as much for me as I was putting this together. The Lord was reminding me of different things. That's what we have tonight. We've learned that tears can be turned into joy as we run toward and cling to Jesus. We learn that as we walk with the Lord, we're going to have to believe in things that we just don't see sometimes right in front of us. We're going to have to take our eyes off the empty tomb and put them on Jesus and his promises that he made to us, that he makes to us, and to love us, that we are his workmanship, his masterpiece. We're not wasted. We're not worthless. We're, we're worth everything to him. If you wonder what your worth is, stop and take a look at the cross. Grace is the free gift that we get that we don't deserve. It's not cheap. I, I can't stand it when people will accuse preachers that preach about grace. Oh, you're just preaching cheap grace. It's not cheap. It cost him everything for us because we're worth it to him. Amen? Amen. Well, let's stop there and let's pray tonight. Heavenly Father, we love you and we thank you for your message of hope. 
We thank you that you've risen on this Super Sunday, Lord, so long ago, and that you're alive and working, actively searching for us, Lord. Thank you for taking our sins to the cross, Lord. We love that. Thank you for rising from the dead. You have victory, Lord. At the cross, you killed death, Lord. You emptied the tomb, and you live now, Lord. And our hope is firmly placed in you. Maybe you've been sitting here tonight and you've been just contemplating like, I don't know, I don't know. But the Holy Spirit's been tugging on your heart this whole night saying, this is my story. This is the truth that I'm testifying to. Maybe you're sitting here thinking, I I do need to change my life. Maybe you're watching online and you're thinking, I need to give my life to the Lord. Now's your chance. We want you to know that you'll spend forever with the Lord. We want you to know your sins are forgiven. If you want to know that too, man, we want to pray with you right now. So we'll pray with you right now. It's a short prayer. We say it all the time because we don't want anybody to feel embarrassed. It's a simple prayer like this. Lord Jesus, I surrender. I give you my life. Forgive me of my sin and fill me with your Holy Spirit so that I may serve you from this day forward. And all of God's kids agreed by saying amen. Hey guys, God bless you guys. No one's told you that they love you. I love you, church. God bless you. Good night.